So my name is Kathy Etz, and I am the Director of Native Programs at the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. And I am honored uh, to be here to moderate this panel and want to thank uh, the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian uh, Health Research, uh, study, something, health, there we go, uh, uh, for asking me to be here. Um, the title of this panel uh, is Parenting as Medicine Against Toxic Stress, Trauma, and Substance Use best practices. Um, and uh, Melissa had her person come up with the t-shirt on, and I actually realized I have my own prop with me. So this is my ID for work, and this is the uh, parenting program that Alicia and Nancy uh, direct, and this is from D. Bigfoot's uh, Indian Country Child Trauma Center. So I carry pieces of this presentation with me every single day. Um, so that's my prop. Um, so anyway, I am pleased to uh, introduce the first talk. Um, we'll have two presenters. The first is Dr. Nancy Whitesell, um, who is a developmental psychologist and associate professor at the Center for American Indian and Alaska Health, Native Health Research at, uh, at University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, she's been engaged in research with tribal communities for 15 years, um, using community university partnerships, a developmental perspective, and prevention science methods to understand risks and promote positive outcomes among Native children and families. Um, if you don't know, Nancy is also a wonderful mentor um, and has probably uh, been responsible for statistics on more papers uh, that have to do with American Indian and Alaska Natives than any other single person. Um, so if you have any uh, junior academics uh, who need a good mentor, uh, let, we can send them Nancy's way. Um, the uh, second person who will be presenting in this session is uh, Dr. Alicia Mousseau. And uh, Alicia, or Dr. Mousseau is a member of the Oglala Sioux uh, Tribe Research Review Board, is a research instructor with, uh, also uh, with Nancy and Michelle. Um, at the uh, uh, Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health at the Colorado um, School of Public Health, University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, she's currently director of this program that I can't pronounce, um, but I'm sure she'll pronounce for you, um, which is a family-based substance use prevention program. Alicia also has the distinction of being uh, one of the few PhD researchers who's managed to figure out how to do that from her home community. Um, and that's something that I think is really exciting. She's able to live and work at home. So if you want tips on how to do that, she's the person to ask. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask them up. It's on this screen, but it's not. Oh, here, it's just right there in the yeah. Celine is on here. Hmm. Probably oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was it was so thank you for the intro, Kathy. My name is Alicia Musso. Um, my parents are the late John and Vera Musso, and my grandparents are the late Lena and James Musso, and we're from the Porcupine District in Porcupine, in, on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, and my Hunka parents are Karen Spoonhunter Brown and uh, Howard Brown of the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. Um, so today, with my colleague Nancy, we're going to be talking about um, a family-based substance use prevention program called Tiwahe Guashakapi, um, which translates to strengthening families. Um, so today, today, some of our objectives, we're just going to give you some of the background and some of the rationale of, of Tiwahi Gulashakopi, um, the adaptation process, um, some of our anticipated program effects, some lessons learned, and some recommendations. So my colleagues are probably upset that I put this up here, uh, but this is our, this is our field team, um, and I have so much appreciation and respect for them. They're like my, my family, um, and we, we <laughs> I wanted to show, show them and show our field office um, and we try to support other health activities. So you can see we got into a colorectal cancer awareness month um, photo contest where you had to wear blue, so we wore blue. Uh, <laughs> a little bit more about our, about our um, Centers for American Indian Alaska Native Health field team and office is we've been operating continuously for over 25 years. We have 10 um, employees currently right now, and we have a range of different um, 
uh, employ <laughs> employment in that because we have to work the university system um, if we need people immediately. So we have a couple temporary, couple student research assistants, um, professional research assistants, and a field office director, and I'm the faculty research instructor. And you can see some of our little demographics. Most of us live on the res, most of us are indigenous. Um, we have a wide age range. We have some parents and grandparents and a variety of different education levels. And this is our larger TG team. Um, as you can see, it takes um, a village, truly, to raise a family and to raise a child. Um, so we have different community, university, and funding levels of people. You can see there's been a variety of different people who have worked with us um, and, and the current people we have. So we just wanted to show that you know, it takes a large team to run some of these programs we have in Indian country. So the empirical rationale for our project, I'll let Nancy take over and talk about some of our previous research. Okay, so I'm gonna just fill in a little bit of the background. Um, we have, as Alicia said, there's been a field office um, on the reservation for more than 25 years, and the Centers for American Indian Alaska Native Health, Health have been involved in a wide variety of research that started out sort of with a lot of epidemiological research, so sort of documenting what are the, what are the concerns, what are the health issues and the disparities and then moved into what we call ideological research, so trying to understand what's behind those issues. Um, this, is a, this chart is from one of those studies where we um, measured substance use in middle school youth and followed them over time to, to try to understand where was the initiation of substance use. And this, this chart is a little hard to, to decipher probably at that size, and I'm not gonna go into it in detail, but the main point is that we see escalating risk. So these are, are probabilities of initiation of marijuana, alcohol, and tobacco use at different ages, and you see the escal escalation quite early, 11 to 12 years old for a lot of substance use. Um, so this um, was really important data for us. We shared it with a um, community advisory board that we were working with there to help us understand what these data mean. And um, what, what we felt and what the community advisory board really reinforced, we'll talk about that in a little bit more, was we need to do something about this and we need to do it early because youth are beginning to experiment with these substances quite early. Um, this is just another uh, bit of data from some of that earlier work we did showing the links between early initiation of substance use and later substance use problems. There's a lot of data out there um, that says that youth who start using alcohol or drugs at early ages have a host of problems later on, um, in including a highly increased risk for substance use disorder, but also just all the other risk behaviors that are associated with that during adolescence and the problems that those um, in gender, and these data show that that's no different in this community, in this population. Um, and then this I just wanted to share, as I said, we had these data, we took them back to our community advisory board and said help us make sense of this, and really what we heard from them was this does make sense, this is what we're seeing in the community, so they shared a lot of similar observations of what they saw as early use in their community, they said to us, we need to do something, we need to do it now, we need to start early. Um, they also told us a couple of other things that were very important in our deciding which direction to go in trying to intervene. One is that they believe very strongly that prevention is inherent within their culture and cultural teachings, and that any effort we made needed to build on what was there, what their resources were there, and the strengths of the community and also that prevention should involve families. So they didn't want us just to be working with youth. They wanted us to bring families in. They wanted us to help support families and support parents as they're trying to do what they can to support the good, good positive development of their youth. Um, so those were some things we took forward. You'll see as we talk more about our program. And this was kind of our um, template for how we decided to work. So you hear a lot if you're in research circles about rigorous science and the importance of rigorous science. We've been talking about that this morning, the importance of evidence, right? We want to know that what we're doing really works, and we have methods for being able to figure that out. So we want to use that. But it's also really critical that we have cultural validity. We can't just take programs that work in other populations and say, let's drop these in, they'll work just fine, right? We need to be very thoughtful about what works in this community, what builds on the community cultural teachings, and how do we blend that. So we talk about that as bringing those two things together, is we need not just scientific rigor, but we need cultural and scientific rigor. We need to be just as rigorous about the cultural end of that as we are about the scientific end of that. And if we aren't, 
then the best science we do will give us garbage. It won't be, it really won't be good science. Um, so this is, we kind of, and, and we went through this process, a cyclical process with our community advisors, where we went out and I tried to identify evidence-based programs that built on those kinds of things they wanted, right, that were family-based. We had a lot of discussions with them, sifting through a lot of options. In the end, together we came up with choosing the Iowa Strengthening Families Program for parents and youth, 10 to 14, because of the things that are outlined here. It's family-based, it's delivered in family groups, which was very um, consonant with the cultural idea of extended family, or teospeye. Um, it targeted um, youth in the 10 to 14-year-old range, which was, we wanted to make sure we got early in that range. Um, and it was, it's very well documented for success. It has been used in a lot of different communities and a lot of different cultural groups and been, there's evidence of effectiveness. It's been used in a lot of American Indian communities, but there is no pub, there was no at the time, and I still don't think there is actually quite yet, um, published evidence of successful adaptation. But it was a really good solid base to start with. So this is what we, um, where we began. And then I'm gonna turn it back over to Alicia to tell you where we went from there. So whenever we think of adapting a program for Indian communities, we always think about culture, right? Cultural adaptation. Um, but, you know, culture can mean a lot of different things. It's beliefs, it's practices, it's um, ways of life. Um, and so that's one thing that, you know, thinking about adapting this program, what is culture, what cultural adaptations do we want to make? Um, and I have one of my favorite definitions by one of our community advisory boards, Chris Eaglehawk. Um, and his plain statement, he, he says it in our videos and stuff like that, is culture is just knowing right from wrong in whatever situation you're in, whatever context, whatever community, culture is knowing right from wrong. So, you know, always thinking about our community advisory board and that feedback we get from them, but also what we know in the literature, as Nancy talked about. Um, so going to the literature again for adaptation suggestions and looking to see what's been done with other programs um, and how to follow a model, um, there's also, there's general adaptations out there, um, so HHS um, put out this general ad adaptations with the green light, yellow light, red light. Um, also there's SFP, not specific to Iowa State, but there's another Strengthening Families program out there, and they gave specific do's and don'ts um, adaptation-wise. Um, and as you can see, some of the specific adaptations for a specific um, program, there are a lot of like, just do graphic things, you know, surface level things. And I understand that, that's their baby, right? Like you don't wanna, you don't wanna mess with someone's baby too much. Um, but some of the general adaptations were, were, you know, change if it's a better fit, the green light, or be, consult some experts, you know? Um, so keeping all these things in mind when doing adaptations of what's the best fit or what to do, what not to do, um, we did consult the literature on that. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind is um, the heterogeneity within our tribes, within tribal communities. Um, and I just put this up here as an illustration about, so um, the different Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota, which a lot of people call us the Sioux. Um, these are all of our, our tribes, you know, and everyone's in different communities. Um, so we do have similar, you know, language and dialects and some practice and traditions, but as someone mentioned earlier, there's a lot of heterogeneity within our, within our groups, so that is something else to think about when adapting a program. So what do we do with all of this? Um, <laughs> with, our, with our empirical evidence, with our community advisory board evidence, with what we know, with, with thinking about um, the larger suggestions and adaptations. Um, I love the American Indian College Fund Think Indian ads, because um, really, you know, taking all that together and trying to, trying to make something uh, that's best fit for our communities, I think this is an amazing ad. Um, so, Thinking Indian, you can see a buffalo, right? Um, and it's just a buffalo, but as an Indian, you can see a lot more. And in our tribe, in, um, we used every part of the buffalo. We made use of everything. Everything was a tool, everything we could make something of. So taking all that we got um, with the, all the previous information I just gave you, these are some of the phases we went through for our adaptation. So we did some of those surface level things that they recommended, which is changing the logo, changing our name to, t you know, with the, with the tribal, with our using our language. Um, we also created videos with indigenous actors so our participants could see people who look like them. Um, we did a larger overhaul on the tribe, um, using a tribal kinship model. So we focused on the extended family, which we've been talking about all day today, um, and used more kinship terms and relational terms. 
Um, and I like this excerpt from Ella Carr Delorio from her fictional book, Water Lily. And it's the ultimate aim of Dakota life, stripped of accessories, was quite simple. One must obey kinship rules and one must be a good relative. So thinking about that cultural adaptation, using our kinship rules and using our, our relations as, as our major adaptation so that we, we have more representation in our program. Um, we also use tri tribal language versus English, so we have that to compare as well. So this is just to give you an, uh, to show you our kinship model. Uh, so we use a collateral relationship, and that's a technical term, um, <laughs> instead of a linear relationship. So as you can see, um, it's, it's based on gender, so, and it's also, everything is connected one step further. So a female or a male's mother, their mother's sisters would also be their mother. So it extends that family out. Um, and we, we promote this in our program, and we, we tell families how to use this, but we also, like I mentioned earlier, we use the Lakota language. Um, and everybody in Lakota language has a kinship term based on male or female. So this is just a male term, male kinship diagram. Um, the female kinship diagram, the, the language would be a little bit different for some of the different kinship terms. So this is one of our major ad overhaul ad adaptations that we used. Also, we did the culturally grounding videos, so we did keep core messages. We consulted with Iowa State on that. We worked with a local acting group. Uh, we filmed in locations that were familiar, that looked like our houses and our homes. Um, we also um, changed some of the situations in the video. So there was one situation of in-laws coming to stay the weekend with the family, and a lot of our in-laws, we live with them. So <laughs> we, we changed that whole thing um, to talk about like a birthday party and how to plan for that. You know, just more relevant to our communities and their situations. Um, and once again, we incorporated tribal language in there. So this is just some pictures from our video adaptations. It was very bare bones. There was no film crew. It was me holding a light and my <laughs> colleague Brad with the camera. <laughs> um, but the, the actors were amazing and we, we are totally grateful for them for helping us with this. So the phase two was the informed adaptation. So we did some of those surface level things and then we went to the informed adaptations. What have our community advisory board said? You know, what is in the literature? And one thing our community advisory board said was um, listening is important. It's really important. And in the original Iowa State program, it was in the fifth session. And so, or maybe it was a sixth and there's only seven sessions. So we moved that to the front with communication with um, Iowa State and they said that's fine. Move, move it to the second session because um, listening and communication is important. Um, we also went to the literature, and we've been talking about ACEs are important as well. Um, so we added a whole session on what is trauma, what is adverse experiences, um, giving legal information about how to report these things, um, giving resources and support too. So what do you do if your child is um, does experience or witness some traumatic event? And actually, the the suggestions for that actually lined very well with our program and our program concept, so it worked out very well. Um, we also added you know, different things to different um, sessions, including mindfulness and mindset theory, which have been used with adolescents, so we added pieces of those in the youth session. We also added native narration pieces, which we have local people talking about the topics that we have, um, so that it gives a local feel of what, if, you know, what, what locals are saying, and most of, most of them are elders, so they talk about trauma, they talk about listening, how to listen well, and those are just different clips that we have integrated into our videos. And then we also developed a nutrition session to replace a substance use prevention, and a Facebook component, which Nancy will explain a little bit better of why we did that. So part of this, this kind of goes back to the rigorous science piece of this. We wanted to make sure if we're doing this that we have a good method for evaluating what we're doing to see what works and what doesn't work. But we took um, a sort of a different approach than you may have heard of um, often. This is called the MOST design, multiphase optimization strategy for engineering effective interventions. It's a mouthful and it comes from sort of an engineering frame. But the idea of this is instead of taking a full intervention, and plopping it in and comparing, you know, having some people not get it at all and some people get everything and comparing that, this design allows you to look at different components of the intervention and get estimates of which components are most effective. So the idea is at the end we'll be able to say, this was really good, let's keep that. This wasn't so good, let's get rid of that. And we'll build the most effective intervention we can by using this approach. So. This was the design we used, and as Alicia said, we had this basic adaptation. Many of the things that she's talked about, including um, using the kinship roles and responsibilities, the kinship model is a really integral part of the, of the intervention. 
but we also wanted to try out three different things. So one of them was to have this sort of enhanced language piece. So where it's not all, the whole intervention is not in Lakota. As Alicia said, there's a wide variety of where people are in terms of whether they speak any of the language at all or not. But we felt like the, the meaning of language and the importance of language, and this was advice from our community advisors, but there, it carries a lot of weight. And so we wanted to connect people with language in some way that was sort of in the middle there. So this language um, adaptation focuses on language, uh, Lakota language for kinship terms. So it's really reinforcing those kinship messages. But some of our participants get that and some of them get it all in English. So we'll be able to tell if that added, what the added value of that language um, piece is. The other piece, and we kind of call this our, we, we talk about the language as sort of our traditional cultural adaptation, and we talk about Facebook as our contemporary cultural adaptation, because everybody in the community, that's probably an overstatement, Facebook is very prevalent, and people use it a lot to stay connected and to communicate with one another across this, this big expanse of the reservation. They may not see each other every day, but they're communicating. So we've added a Facebook supplement that some of our groups, there's a Facebook group that they join as well as the in-person group, and there's messages and quizzes and posts and things that happen between sessions. And we're exploring whether that helps engage the families more fully in the intervention and build the networks among them that we're hoping to build. And then the last one is, we had some question about whether we really need the substance use specific content or not. This is a substance use prevention program but it's really about strengthening families. It's really about building family bonds and communication and, and roles and responsibilities. And so, and there's some stigma attached to being, to participating in a substance use prevention program. So we're curious about whether the protective effects um, are apparent for youth, even if we don't sit down and teach them how to say no to drugs, basically. So we have um, this, once one of the groups gets the standard substance use prevention from uh, the original strengthening families, the other group gets a healthy eating nutrition exercise. So it's something that should be beneficial to them, but it doesn't have anything to do with substance use. So we're gonna see the value of that substance use specific focus there. Um, was it back to you? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> So the final phase is just getting approval. Um, so we had com consistent communication with our community advisory board with Iowa State um, about you know the changes we were making and what to, what to add. Um, so we did have a pre-pilot, a pilot, and a post-pilot. We made changes throughout, um, and then we we're in implementation phase right now. We have one more cohort to go. Um, and we'll be done with our cohorts in December 2017. Um, and we've also done multiple facilitator trainings, and we've done a hybrid um, so Iowa State and TG hybrid training. Um, and actually, what the verdict is that we're still considered Iowa State strengthening families 10 to 14 and that adapted version. Um, and I put no complaints from the community because if you know our communities, <laughs> that's a compliment. Um, <laughs> um, so the sample, Nancy, do you want to do the sample? Yep. Sure, I can do this real quick. Um, so basically, we are working with youth that are 10 to 14 years of, years of age, and we're, we're trying really to get the 10 to 12-year-olds, but we want to be inclusive of families, so we're, we're using that whole age range. Um, and then we're inviting the parents of those participating youth, and we define parent very broadly. So it may be mom and dad, it may be auntie, it may be grandma, it can be anyone who's involved as a parent of that child, in parenting that child as a caregiver. Um, and we allow them to bring up to three adults with them to the session. Um, we're, we're doing this in 20 groups, so we started a while back. We're, in, we're getting ready to go into our sixth cohort because we can't do 20 groups at a time. Our field staff is amazing, but they do need to sleep. So um, we, we run groups every night of the week, well, Monday through Thursday in the fall and the spring, and we've been sort of cycling through um, with different families. We're delivering this in 12 communities around the reservation. So every fall or spring, we try to be in dispersed places so that families living in that general area, if they want to access it at that time and their child's the right age, they can access it. It is a lot of work for our field staff who put a lot of miles on their cars driving all over the place. Um, and we are, our, our target sample is 176 youth and then which means 176 families. We have more adults than that participating. So um, I think, and I think we're gonna be pretty close to um, meeting that target um, at the end of December when we wrap up. Um, and then 
okay, good, sorry, I'm sorry, I've lost track of who's doing what. Um, <laughs> this is just a quick overview of some of the things we think will happen. This is our anticipated program effects, and these are based largely on program effects that have been de demonstrated with Strengthening Families program in other communities. So, you know, a lot of positive change in the parent-child relationship, communication, positive affect, um, for parents, um, learning skills in effective parenting strategies, so monitoring, rule setting, discipline. Um, others have talked about those a little bit. Um, parental self-efficacy, parents feeling good about what they're doing and able to do this job. I mean, one of the things about doing this intervention sort of at the transition to adolescence is that, um, just like as, as Allison talked about with early childhood, we see transition to adolescence as another opportunity, another moment that we can intervene with parents because they've gotten this sort of parenting a child thing down and now their child is becoming something else. And they need help, right? Um, we all, I've been there, we all need kind of help knowing what to do. How much do you back off? How much do you stay, you know, stay involved and, and stay on top of what your child is doing? So it's a lot of support for parents and just some, some information that's helpful. Um, also, things like cultural identity and engagement, you know, through our, through our use of the kinship model and the language, we're trying to make, you know, to, to make some difference in people's connection to their culture. And then we expect to see some decrease in family conflict and adolescent substance use, or because we are targeting these young adolescents, we're hoping to see delay in initiation of use. Um, and this, I, I'll share this. Um, <laughs> this is, we have, our data are still not all in because of the way we're doing this rolling enrollment, right? We won't have all the data until December. But we have been asking people to do evaluations at the end and tell us one thing they've learned in the program, right? And these, I, I, one thing that's interesting, you'll see this to the next slide too, but these are the one to two to three word answers we get from youth, but they're great words, right? I mean, they're learning leadership. They're learning not to do drugs. I like that they're learning to help someone. And to make a TP is the activity we do on the first night. They build a TP together as a family. So that's an unintended benefit, I guess. Um, and then the parents say a little bit more. But I think the, it, it's, we are having a lot of positive feedback from the families that we're involved with. And, and as Alicia said, we haven't had complaints. But we've also had very positive feedback from families. When we go at the end, I get to drop in sort of beginning and end. And when we go in at the end, it's great to hear them talk to us about the changes they've seen in their children and in their families. Um, do you wanna? So just some lessons learned throughout this whole process. Um, local research stat and researchers and staff are invaluable. Without them, we would not be able to deliver this program um, and reach our families and get them to come and help with retention and recruitment um, and know how to find a caterer and <laughs> all those little things that you don't really know until you're in the community and you live there and you know who to talk to or who to find. Um, so local, those local champions are key. Um, they help you troubleshoot. Um, they make the project ha happen. They're the, they're the community change makers. Um, another lesson learned is to think outside of the box. Um, like I mentioned, the caterer, there's very limited. Um, There you go. Um, so we, you know, we had food at all the different schools, and we found the best cook, and we asked her to be our caterer, and she's amazing. Um, so thinking outside the box just on those things, but also, I mean, even our design, our research design is, is not the normal RCT or anything like that. It's, you know, taking a couple steps back to look, to what can we do to make these fit in our communities better? Um, and being flexible, like Nancy said, our, our facilitators put a lot of miles on, on our cars. We've gone through, I don't know how many suitcases because we carry all our stuff out. Um, they they had spend a lot of time away from their families to be with our community's families. Um, and so being flexible and also um, university side too, making things work. I mentioned that we do have graduate assistants and we have um, we have uh, temporary hires that we, you know, we have to figure out how to work in these different systems that we're all working in, uh, tribally and, and funding and also university-wise. Um, so also that leads me into the culture of science, um, talking about that and how it's different in academia and for funders and publishers and tribal communities. And I don't think we've necessarily defined the culture of science in tribal communities yet. And um, so, which leads me to the last one, which is building that research capacity. It's, it's limited, but the potential is great. Like I showed our field staff. I know Johns Hopkins has amazing field staff. Um, it's, it's, the potential is amazing. We just have to invest in that and, and try to build that culture of science in our tribal communities. 
which is some of our recommendations. But the first one is just um, supporting and funding and building and sustainable local research. Um, it, we've gone through so many um, facilitators trying to find people to, because it is a lot of work. It's a, and doing research, but also implementing a program. Um, there's a lot to juggle there. Uh, and so building that on the ground local research capacity is, is something that is greatly needed. Um, and it will, like hiring local staff, researchers, um, having a field office, um, community outreach and education just to let your community know what research is. Because um, sometimes community doesn't know when you're giving them consent form, they're like, what is this? Um, and then just collaborating with tribal communities. We have so many tribal communities that could use the data that we have to apply for grants or to do a collaboration with. Um, and so building that, that research capacity, but um, making that culture of science in our communities more prevalent also funding and supporting the implementation of empirically supported programs. I know, you know, we want to be innovative and, and um, come up with new ways and adapt different programs, but we do have programs. The diabetes program has, is an NIDDK program implemented in your community. Um, you, you can make adaptations as you go, honestly. Like, I used to do diabetes prevention in my community, and we would talk about how much calories are in fry bread. You know, it just naturally comes up um, about, like, oh, I had to go to you know, a birthday party or this or that. We just know, so having local implementers implement the program is actually kind of adaptation in itself. Um, but if we had more of those programs, empirically supported programs in our communities, not necessarily um, more of implementation, that I feel like that would be really helpful in, in getting just empirically supported programs in our communities. And finally, just, um, we don't really have much of this, and I don't really see much of this, but I do know um, tribal, communities and tribal governments. Um, we need support, and also just tribal programs, need support and technical guidance on how to write policies for our families. You know, what, what policies just in tribal programs could help our families? What, tri what policies in tribal government can help our families? Um, so just getting some technical guidance on that and how to um, make health a part of our, our everyday lives in the sense of policy and in the sense of our governments and our workplace and such like that. So. And we want to end with our team again, this time not in blue, um, because they are the ones who really make it happen. Um, they're, you know, they're, they are the change makers, and um, without them, this program would not happen. So some thank yous. Those are information. And Uh, great, thank you, that was wonderful. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michelle Sarche, and uh, uh, she is a clinical psychologist and associate professor in the Center for American Indian and Alaska Native Health, uh, again at University of Colorado on Chutes Medical Campus. Um, Dr. Sarche has uh, worked with tribal communities for over 20 years, even though she only looks about 20, so I'm not sure how that's possible. Um, childhood. childhood. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, her work has focused um, on early childhood and maternal factors and has been supported by multiple agencies and institutes, including the Administration for Children and Families, the Health Resources and, uh, Services Administration, and the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, Mental Health, and Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Those are three different institutes. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarche. Good afternoon, everybody. It's always nice to be with um, lots of familiar faces, and just when I think I know everybody doing the work that I do, I meet new people. And so it's really great to meet um, probably more new people here than, than familiar faces. So I wanted to acknowledge a colleague, uh, Dolores Subia Bigfoot. Um, Dr. Bigfoot has been doing um, research and clinical work with tribal communities and children for many, many years. And um, the work that she's done on parent-child interaction therapy, or PCIT, to increase its cultural relevance uh, for tribal children and families is really foundational to some of the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so this presentation, like others, there's um, a lot of intersection with the, the work that's been presented so far. And so, as Dr. Bullock said, 
using the, the crystal metaphor, this is another lens on a topic um, that we've been talking about throughout the day. So my goal today is to talk uh, a little bit about the work of the Buffering Toxic Stress Consortium that's funded by the Administration for Children and Families, and if WJ is still here, um, he was at ACF in the Office of Head Start, and this is uh, through the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, which is at ACF as well. Um, the intervention that we used for our project with a Tribal Early Head Start program, again, that's Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, or PCIT, and uh, you probably couldn't see the logo on Kathy's badge that she showed, but it's, it's this logo right here, and that's from the Indian Country, Indian Country Child Trauma Center that, again, Dr. Bigfoot ran that, um, I believe it was SAMHSA funded for many years, and her work on um, honoring children, uh, that was a series of efforts to adapt three different evidence-based interventions for use with tribal children and families, and that came out of that Indian Country Child Traumatic, uh, or Child Trauma Center. Talk very briefly about some of our implementation experiences in using PCIT in the ways that we did, and then um, about some things that we're really right in the middle of right now in terms of adapting PCIT for um, mobile delivery, <clears throat> and then some next steps. So as I said, the work that I'm gonna focus on is uh, part of the Buffering Toxic Stress Consortium, again, funded by um, ACF, Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. Uh, the, there are six university early Head Start partnership grants across the country that are all working on a common set of activities, each in their own way. And so these are the universities. There's uh, University of Maryland here in Baltimore, University of Delaware, NYU, Washington University in St. Louis, University of Denver, and then our partnership out of the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, ours is the only tribal early Head Start partnership among these six sites. So we've talked a lot about toxic stress. That term has come up a number of times today. So as you may go home and want to do some more reading on the topic yourselves, just wanted to point out um, an article from 2009 that I think does a really good job by Sean Koff, Boyd, and McEwen um, called Neuroscience, Molecular Biology, and the Childhood Roots of Health Disparities building a new framework for health and disease prevention. So that was perhaps a new framework at that time, but has really taken hold in lots of communities, not just tribal communities. But if you go to this paper, um, it summarizes the body of evidence that links adult chronic disease to processes and experiences occurring early in life. And they describe some of those mechanisms, if you will, and again, those have been touched on today. But some, uh, you know, one uh, mechanism they talk about is the cumulative exposure to stressful experiences that overuse, that overuse, sorry, and dysregulate pathways normally used for adaptation to threat, okay? So those physiological processes are there for a reason. They're adaptive, they help us respond to a threat. But when the threat is constant, um, they're, becomes a weathering or a wear and tear on our bodies, on our physiological systems, something referred to as allostatic load, okay? They also talk about uh, other, um, you know, mechanisms related to the latent effects of adversity experienced during sensitive periods in which the developing brain is more receptive to a variety of environmental signals, whether positive or negative. So if you go to the Center for, uh, Harvard Center for the Developing Child, some of the language they use there is talking about brain architecture and how these early life experiences um, can build or you know, work against the foundations of that architecture that's laid down early in life. And 
So they argue, again, as we've all been talking about here today, that more attention back in 2009 needed to be paid to health promotion and disease prevention strategies based on the reduction of stressors among young children and their parents. And they brought forward, they didn't author this, but they brought forward a taxonomy of stress. I don't know if this has come up today, but I'm sure you've all heard of it to heighten public understanding of the physiological impact of early life stress and its role in lifelong disease. So I just wanted to say briefly that I was sharing with a colleague of mine some of this work, and she said, do you really need research to show that you know, these early life experiences aren't good, have a negative effect? And so I thought of a time that I was interviewing a young mom who was in a domestic violence situation, and she had young children. And I asked her what she thought the effect of that domestic violence might have on her children. And she said they were too young to remember. And so I feel like what this body of work does, even though it's very intuitive, we don't, we don't need research to tell us, most of us, that these traumatic, stressful early life experiences are bad for development. But I think that it does help in terms of a public discourse that these are things that you may not have a conscious memory of, but the body remembers. And that's also to say, or not to say, that you're locked in and what happens to you when you're two or three or, or younger in utero, you know, predestines you for the rest of your life. But I think it, also means that we don't overlook and we don't underestimate the impact that those experiences can have. So this is um, a framework for bringing, uh, yeah, really in this toxic stress framework, the role of the caregiving relationship, whomever that may be with, mom, dad, extended family, um, someone said that, Bron Friend Brenner said, you need one person who's crazy about you. So it's that idea of, you know, what happens is not so much that a particular stressor has occurred in your life, but that as a young child, you have somebody who can help you make sense of, who can help you uh, perhaps metabolize and, and, and deal with uh, the emotional dysregulation, for example, that results. And so um, they came up with this taxonomy of stress uh, and thinking of stress as positive. That would be growth-promoting types of experiences. We all have to learn how to deal with stress in our lives and how um, someone, I think Al said, about you know life is one big problem. <laughs> that you have to be prepared to solve, you know? And so when you have manageable early life stress and stress throughout the life, you know, your life, but you have people help you figure out how to deal with it, that's a positive thing, okay? And then tolerable stress, the nature of those stress, and, and, the, and stress here has to do with the extent to which the body returns to equilibrium physiologically, okay? So positive stress, it's a very quick return to baseline. Tolerable stress might be more activation, but an eventual return. Toxic stress happens when the body is constantly physiologically activated and there's no recovery. And often that happens um, really critically in the context of the absence of supportive caregiving, okay? So that's the framework that our Buffering Toxic Stress Consortium operates from, to pursue three goals cross-site. And that is to assess cortisol as a marker of stress among young children and their parents. So each of those six sites is in some way measuring cortisol and its relationship to stress among young children and their parents served by Early Head Start. To examine the possibilities for implementing parenting interventions within the context of Early Head Start. I think Early Head Start and Head Start and other early childhood education programs are really important levers for the kinds of work that we're talking about doing. Despite the humidity here, I'm still very thirsty. <laughs> um, and thanks, Kathy. <laughs> 
<laughs> to assess the effectiveness of parenting interventions for strengthening the parent-child relationship as a buffer of toxic stress. So I wanted to talk a little bit <clears throat> about this second one. I have no idea how I'm doing on time either. So somebody help me. <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about parent-child interaction therapy, or PCIT, and the core components. So PCIT emphasizes two dimensions of parenting acting in concert with one another. The provision of emotional or relational warmth in the caregiving relationship and uh, the you know, availability and existence of clear and consistent structure. Okay. And so PCIT is typically delivered in a clinic or office-based setting um, with the parent and the child together. There's 16 sessions with live, in-the-moment coaching using a bug-in-the-ear uh, process. So you have a PCIT coach watching through a two-way mirror, one-way mirror, where you can see people, but they can't see you, and you're, you're coaching them in the ways of PCIT, live, in-the-moment. And so there's two components of PCIT that parallel those dimensions of parenting. Um, one is called child-directed interaction, where the, the parents work on parenting skills that foster warmth and connection. And then parent-directed interaction, where uh, parents are taught effective behavior management and limit-setting skills that, again, help build structure and reduce coercive escalating patterns of interaction. So I was just trying to boil uh, down what's called CDI and PDI. So um, just to give you a sense for what happens, how parents build these skills that may be uh, aspects of that buffering relationship. And so in CDI, child-directed interaction, it's all about following the child's lead. And across all of those six buffering toxic stress consortium sites, they're all using interventions that promote, uh, that create space and skills for parents following the child's lead, to be emotionally uh, present with their child. And so PCIT does this through something called PRIDE skills. Um, it's a nice acronym, and it stands for praise, reflect, imitate, describe, and enjoy. So those are the do's. And the don'ts are parents are directed not to question command or criticize their child, okay? And they practice these pride skills during something called special time. And so that's some homework that they have when they're in PCIT, that each day for five minutes um, in a protected physical and I think psychological space as well, parents um, practice these pride skills as the basis for building that emotional connection. And in terms of the parent-directed interaction, it teaches effective behavior management and limit setting, like I said. Um, and that's done by helping parents develop a consistent and predictable approach to behavior management. And so there's, these are the different pathways um, in PCIT. And I'll tell you in just a second what effective commands are. But that is the basis for all um, effective behavior management in PCIT is knowing how to give an effective command, one that is very clear and unmistakable. And so there's different pathways the child can obey, and then they're giving, given something called labeled praise. They can disobey, warn, obey, labeled praise. And then another pathway is leading to a, a very targeted and um, prescribed and approach basically to timeout called the quiet chair. So I'm not going to read all of this, but basically effective commands um, are those that are direct. They tell the child exactly what to do and that you want him or her to do it. It's positively stated, so saying walk instead of don't run. They are given one at a time. Put the Legos in the box instead of clean up the playroom. So it's really broken down and very clear. They're specific. They help the child know what you want him or her to do. Um, so get off the chair instead of be careful. I'm guilty of all of these things. <laughs> they're age appropriate. Um, and so they're things that a child has the ability to do. You're not expecting something that he or she can't do. 
They're polite and respectful, um, using a neutral tone to foster listening right away instead of only when you raise your voice. And they include explanations. It's time to go to the store. Please put on your shoes. And they're only given when necessary. Too many commands can build frustration. So if it is something a child must do, it's better to give a command than a choice. Okay, so those are just some of the basic principles. So um, when we went to, we, we got um, a PCIT, our model for our site, um, some of the other sites used early Head Start home visitors to develop their parenting intervention in the context of their regular early Head Start home visits. The particular program we partnered with did not have a home visiting component. So we partnered with the behavioral health program um, to do this. So we got a PCIT uh, coach trained. It took about a, a year of training and a lot of supervision and observation for that uh, person to be trained. And, but once they were trained, there were just a lot of implementation barriers. Um, parents' busy schedules, transportation challenges, lack of childcare, family emergencies and personal crises. I'm sure all of you doing intervention are familiar with these sorts of things. And perhaps their motivation. This, we took a universal approach, anybody could come. So, you know, it's not clear how if you were having problems, whether you were motivated to go or whether it's just too hard to change what you were doing or if you weren't really seeing yourself as having a lot of problems, maybe you didn't feel the need to go. And on the provider side, we had a committed but busy staff with many competing demands. And like I said, training was intensive. And when, so when staff leave, it takes time to replace them. So this is just a real high level um, summary um, of what we're doing. Uh, to adapt, so if you think of those kind of core messages and core approaches of PCIT, we were, we're wondering, we still won't know until we actually do this, but um, we've translated them into a series of text messages and um, taking more of a universal health promotion approach. We felt, we being um, uh, a colleague of mine who's a PCIT trainer, um, has extensive experience using PCIT, in a variety of populations, and she was doing some similar work with Latino moms in Denver to adapt for mobile um, use. And so um, we felt that those messages were pretty clear and amenable to um, a text messaging based approach um, with links to videos that would give illustrations of what, it, or what do pride skills look like, what do the do's and the don'ts look like. And so we're really right now in the process of trying to extract these PCIT pearls, if you will, and um, put them into text messages. Um, and so in, a, in the context of working in tribal communities, Alicia talked about this already, but cultural adaptation is a given. And adaptation aims to increase the cultural and contextual uh, resonance and fit in hopes of increasing the accessibility, meaning and relevance, and up, hopefully uptake and effectiveness of interventions. And so those can be process adaptations or content adaptations. And so we're really working on a process adaptation. Five minutes, okay. So um, uh, this is where I wanna transition, um, and I'm just gonna share directly the words of my colleague, Dr. Bigfoot, who could not be here today. Um, and talk a little bit about the work. We're really benefiting from the work that she's done already, as I shared at the beginning, um, that's uh, summarized in this article, um, Honoring Children, Making Relatives, the Cultural Translation of Parent-Child Interaction Therapy for American Indian and Alaska Native Families. So if you don't mind, I wanna stay true to her words. Um, basically, the next two slides are using beating as a metaphor, both for the um, PCIT coach, who's the provider, and giving him or her a cultural frame of reference um, for how to deliver PCIT in an American Indian context. So this is a metaphor. Um, so beadwork is a common but highly personalized skill among many American Indian and Alaska Native artists with exquisite variety in design and application. However, certain features remain the same with the necessary and required needle, thread, backing, colored beads, cutting implements, wax, desired design, required measurements, and buckskin or similar material for shape and form. 
So Alicia, in what you were sharing, sort of those things that you wouldn't change, in your case, strengthening families that, that are core and stay there. The creativity and beauty of the beadwork piece is at the heart and beauty of the bead, uh, uh, sorry, heart and hands of the gifted artist or therapist or facilitator. However, the structure, form, and function comes from the common elements which the artist uses to bring forth the exquisite piece. The therapeutic process of PCIT is very similar. The skilled clinician uses the common components of PCIT of explaining, educating, skill building, listening, attending, storytelling, modeling, praise, enthusiasm, etc., to produce the structure of PCIT while deciding that complementary features they wish to add in personalizing or making the structure more of their own. So in this article, there are examples of how you do that with specific elements of PCIT, and Dr. Bigfoot herself has been a cultural consultant to people implementing PCIT in tribal contexts. I just want to read this one other one, and this would be something to help parents have a foothold for understanding PCIT within their cultural frame. With this treatment, we know what to expect when we follow the protocol or engage in each of the components. It is built with little tiny pieces, common words like, you drew a big blue bus. You are very gentle with the crayons as you draw your bus. Each element is unexceptional until it is all put together, just like in beadwork, very tiny beads, one at a time, create a beautiful piece of art. Okay, I'm just gonna skip these and share a little bit about our next steps. So coming back to our work, Dr. Bigfoot is a partner to us in this work. Um, and so with our current funding from ACF, um, we will be moving to do some focus groups and key informant uh, interviews to get input regarding our adapted structure and content. Um, we'll do some refinement beta testing and more refinement that hopefully will position us for future funding to expand to other communities, do further development and piloting, and hopefully eventually an effectiveness trial. Um, three recommendations. Um, I was really nervous to put these up here because I have no idea how to go about doing any of these things, but I feel like they're very foundational. Um, and I guess I rely on our collective energy and strength and ideas um, for how we can make steps in this direction. And so I drew on the um, Public Health Pyramid um, by Fridan um, and really focusing on, you know, these base layers that um, for the health of a society that socioeconomic factors and changing the context to make individuals default decisions the healthy ones. To me, those were the kinds of things that I feel like in some way our collective work and energy needs to inform. So related to that would be ensuring access to quality education and economic opportunities for a well-prepared workforce ensuring the availability of quality food, housing, and indoor and outdoor spaces to play and exercise. I'm a huge believer in the value of, of exercise and physical activity for children and adults, and ensuring access to quality health care and professionally and culturally, and a professionally and culturally prepared workforce. I just want to say that I, I uh, read, because I can't take my eyes off the news since November, and um, I came across an article today from The Atlantic um, by an economist, and you know, poverty is, is the real common denominator when we talk about ACEs. ACEs happen in all socioeconomic levels, but there's many things working against children in poverty. And um, he's, in his analysis, he says to get out of poverty takes 20 years almost nothing bad happening in those 20 years, staying the course. It has to start in early childhood, and it has to uh, involve education. So um, I just felt that was relevant here, and I guess that for our political leaders and others, um, this is also a call. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so our last speaker uh, will also keep us awake, definitely, uh, and that's Dr. John Walkup. Uh, Dr. Walkup is a professor of psychiatry and also the director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at uh, Will Cornell Medical School, uh, and he's also an adjunct professor here at Hopkins. Um, 
Dr. Walkup has been recognized with uh, the receipt of multiple awards uh, for his work and has also inspired many people uh, and taught a lot of people about parenting and uh, how, to, how to better parent. So I welcome Dr. Walkup. I've gotten into a lot of arguments about parenting too. It's great to be here. And um, I have this thing about ducks. <laughs> so when we were trying to prevent suicide in the, in the mid 1990s among the White Mountain Apache, one of the tribal leaders said, if you want to know what the solution is, look to nature. And I said, what the heck is he talking about? And what I did is I, from that point forward, I was looking to nature for solutions to everything. <laughs> How does nature solve the problem? And what I found out in talking with people on the White Mountain Apache Reservation was that there had been, over time, destruction of the family and of the community. And when I began to look for a model of good family functioning, I looked at ducks and geese. And what I observed was that the mama goose would lead the baby goose by envisioning their future and where she wanted to take them. And in so doing, she led those baby geese to water to swim, to teach them how to fly. And I thought, you know what? That's really what we're all about in terms of restoring family and community is creating parental leaders who lead their children by their vision of what they want for themselves and for the future. So I get teased a lot about the ducks because, because the model of American parenting is this. It isn't walking towards the vision. And those confused American ducklings try to circle behind. <laughs> They're trying to get behind the mom all the time. <laughs> and insofar as they try to get behind the mother and the mother keeps backing up, those little ducklings get very confused. They have identity disturbance. They want to use alcohol and drugs. <laughs> and many of them will get self-injurious and think about suicide. So um, with that, I don't know how to bring my, my uh, topic up. And the person that I... Just click forward. Oh, okay. So the person that I have most of this discussion with is Dr. Atz, who introduced me, which is why I had to do this. So I'm going to talk about resilience and family-based approaches to promoting wellness. I'm going to talk a little bit about what resilience is. How much time do I really have? I think 25 minutes. 25 minutes. So go to just a little after 4. Okay, talk about challenges, developing resilience, helping parents to foster resilience, and then um, how to deal with challenging circumstances. So resilience is pretty easy. It's, it's that capacity to bounce back from difficult life circumstances. But there's three components to it that when you look at every definition of resilience, these three components are there. The first is the commitment to stay engaged. How many of you know someone when they face a difficult situation, they say, I'm out of here? <laughs> we know those people. We may be those people because we face a difficult situation and we get ourselves in that position where we don't re-engage and make that commitment. The next part is you face a difficult situation and you say, there's nothing I can do. We know those people too. Resilient people say, listen, I'm gonna try and make a difference in this very difficult situation. So they stay engaged and they try and make a difference. And lastly, the most important, I think, for longevity with resilience is that they, make, they take on the challenge of learning something from each difficult situation that they're presented with. So those are the three kind of common components to resilience or hardiness. All of this kind of comes out of uh, a modern uh, positive psychology movement, if you will. 
And what they emphasize is they emphasize hope, optimism, resiliency, and confidence. And I add my own little piece at the bottom because I think the key that often is not talked about is how important developing competent young people is in developing their confidence, their resiliency, their hope, their optimism. So when we be first began to develop the family spirit intervention, we thought the most important thing that we have to do is we have to facilitate maternal competence and child competence with the basic fundamental things that children and, and moms have to do. So what can we do to build it? What breaks it down? Where are the problems? And when dealing with low resiliency, what do you do? So I've met many resilient kids, and you probably can picture someone in your own mind who you know to be resilient. One of the things that they have is they have a positive view of themselves. They think in a positive way. They look to the future in a positive way. No matter what has happened to them, they have that positive view. If you look around at their relationships, people care about them. The other thing is that they often have the feeling that there is some respect for who they are, what they've been through, and how they lead their life. And what's interesting is they feel protected, so they have loved ones who care for them and will protect them from challenging circumstances. But the other thing, especially with children, parents are really important in protecting children from their strong, overwhelming emotional experiences. Nothing is more difficult for a child than becoming dysregulated either with laughter and silliness or becoming dysregulated with anger or jealousy or body and behavior discontrol. So what we have as parents, our responsibility is to help kids be protected from the outside dangers of the world. We all know that part. But we also have to help children maintain and contain, if you will, the internal forces that are disruptive to their own regulation. And lastly, we do that really through feeling competent and confident. So how does this happen? So people will, kids will come into my office with their parents and they say, well, I want him to be tougher and more resilient and show a little grit. And doctor, I'm gonna leave him here and I want you to give him that. <laughs> so I pull out my syringe <laughs> and I load it up with resiliency and I pretend that I'm, doesn't work that way. We don't have resiliency to give in that manner. It is relationship dependent Meaning it, you don't learn how to be uh, resilient unless you're in a relationship with a protected, protective and loving adult. It's also task related. So if you think about the kinds of kids that I tend to see as I see kids as young as two or three, all the way up to 25 to 28. And if you look at each of those developmental stages, there are tasks that are absolutely critical to their early development. So for a less than one year old, it is really, really important that they learn how to train their parent to understand the hungry cry. Because if that parent never learns the hungry cry and changes the diaper every time that baby's hungry, that baby's gonna look at that parent and say, I'm in deep trouble. Because <laughs> every time, Every time I look at them with that hungry thing, I get a diaper change, and that's not working for me. So they need the hunger cry, they need the tired cry, and they need, I need a changing cry. They have to figure out how to do that, and the parent has to figure out how to blend. When you see the parent and the child blending around those three cries, it looks absolutely magical. Because the baby says, you know, I don't even have to cry anymore. You just know me. I can look in your eyes and I can see that you can see in five to seven minutes I'm going to start being hungry and you're preparing to feed me. Oh my goodness, I am so blessed. That's, that's what children experience when they're well attached. And that's what we try to do in the family spirit trial is to train parents 
to begin to do just that kind of interacting with their kids. As they get a little bit older, six through 12 year olds, the most important thing for them is to learn how to control their body and their mouth. How to sit, how to stand, how to walk when they should walk, run when they should run, talk where they should talk, not talk when they're not supposed to talk. How to manage their emotions, how to share toys with others. All of those are behavior control tasks that they have to get good at between six and 12. As they move really from 10 to 14, they transition from being taught one-on-one, -on -one, so they have learned academic tasks in a one-on-one, -on -one, but as they move into the early teenage years, they have to learn how to work in groups. How many of you employ people as part of your job? <laughs> how many of you find very talented people but they can't quite work in a group? That is a really important skill and it happens in early to middle adolescence. And so parents, school teachers and others, aunts, uncles, all of those people are involved with helping young people learn how to learn on their own, but learn how to work in groups. And then lastly, really from the mid teenage years and up, they gotta figure out how to make friends, how to keep friends, how to stay away from troublesome peers, how to become intimate with someone, learn how to love and be loved, if you will, manage heartbreak from rejection. All of those are the kinds of things that they need to learn during their mid to late adolescence. And all of those are competencies. You can see kids who do this well, and if you have or touch the mental health system anywhere, you also can see the kids who really don't know how to do those very basic tasks. From my point of view, all of these are mastered within the home environment. Those early developmental tasks are the ones that set the stage for kids developing that capacity. The other thing that we tend to do in our, in our training program is we transition from specific skills to a general pattern. So if you have an eight-year-old and he tells a joke and somebody laughs, what does that eight-year-old do next? He tells that joke to another person and then another person and then another person until he's told a hundred people, until everybody says, please stop. <laughs> but that's what children do. Once they learn something that really works in one context, they take it and they generalize it broadly. So what you want to be doing with kids as you raise them or as we're working with them in the Family Spirit Program, we wanna train those parents to teach their kids these very basic fundamental skills that are so powerful that the young person will use those school skills in a variety of different contexts and generalize them to make their life better. Sadly, from a resilience point of view, there are forces that break it down. So we've heard a lot today about all of the complicated things that occur within reservation communities and, and within our society at large that destroy people's capacity to be resilient. On the other hand, we haven't talked much about those internalizing disorders and externalizing disorders that really make it difficult for people to accumulate competencies over time and to develop confidence. So kids with ADHD have a much harder time developing competence. And as a result, they often suffer low confidence. Many of them, by the time they get into their teenage years, have problems with peer relationships and learning in kind of complicated academic environments. Anxious children, about eight to 10% of kids, anxiety starts between ages six and 12. Anxiety is rust on social skills, competence, and confidence. Because anxious people begin to doubt themselves whenever they're in a situation, even if they've done something well, they doubt their capacity in the next opportunity. And clearly, depressed teenagers 
when they get into situations to build competence, they don't feel competent because they have negative thoughts about themselves and about the world that, again, erode their ability to feel competent or confident. So what do I see? When I see kids who, have, who aren't very resilient, you usually can identify at some point or another that these are kids that haven't been cared about. So there isn't somebody who loves them. And tragically, every once in a while in the office, I'll say, who cares about you or who loves you? And they think for a moment. That should be on the tip of our tongues, right? But some kids haven't been fortunate to have somebody care for them. This one is kind of tricky. Um, not being expected to be resilient. What does that mean? Well, we have, in our larger culture, if someone is disappointed or unhappy, we're kind of supportive of them being disappointed and unhappy, as opposed to looking at them and saying, yes, you're disappointed and unhappy, but is there something now that we can do to make your life better as a result? So we have empathy for the moment, but we don't have the capacity to regroup and help kids move forward with the expectation that they will bounce back, that they will commit, that they will re-engage, and that they will learn something from a difficult life experience. Being respected. Um, you know, parents expect a lot of respect from their children. Expect respect. Um, but you know what? We have to respect bedtime, hunger, toileting, behavior and emotional control task needs. We have to respect that children need us and that we have to be there for them. If we respect what they need, they will again look at us like we are the kinds of adults that will help them move themselves into the future. We have to protect them from the outside world, but we also have to help them organize so that they don't become completely dysregulated. And you know what? It is a process that we see both active and passive. Most of the time when kids are, have problems with resiliency, it's really because these things aren't there but on some level, it's nobody's fault, per se. It's just the circumstances aren't very good. But we do see the situation where there is an active process where the adults in the child's world will actually tear them down and destroy their capacity to be competent and confident. This is one of my favorites. So how do they develop problems with resiliency? Well, you see kids who get too much, I think we call it spoiled sometime, right? But that same spoiled and entitled behavior we see in people who get too little. Really? How does that happen? When you've always gotten everything you've needed and more, you expect it to be there the next time. If you've never gotten it, you feel entitled to have it now. Does that make sense? So I will see families where the young person has really not gotten what they needed and feels entitled to have their needs met. And the parents will look at me and say, he's very spoiled. And I'll say, time out. What he's really talking about are his basic fundamental needs. We're not talking about giving him too much. We're talking about giving him what he really needs. That's what he's really asking for here. So we see that entitlement. It's very difficult in the workforce. But we see that entitlement from people who have always gotten what they want and also from people who haven't gotten what they've needed. Essentially, what you want in the situation is to match what the young person needs as they go along with a little bit of challenge so that they can grow. So in most environments now, this is modern schools, at least the ones that I work with, it's very easy if the youngster is struggling in school for the school to cut expectations. But the problem with lowering expectations is that kids will lower their effort commensurate with the expectations, right? So 
this for me is the curse of low expectations. It's one of the reasons why we don't like to label children, because if we label children with an incompetency, then essentially what we do is we create a self-fulfilling prophecy that they will lower their behavior or their capacity to that lower expectation. What we don't do as well in this society is we don't really challenge and mobilize kids to really take on challenges over time. So when I'm working with a youngster who's got a learning disability, for example, I really do want the school to cut that kid a break. But once they cut him a break, I also want them then to use that platform to build. So it'll look really much more like this, where I'm cutting to find their baseline functioning. But then it's my responsibility, the school's responsibility, the family's responsibility to help them grow and develop their capacity over time. So it has both compassion, which is the lowering of expectations, but it also has built within it that expectation that the young person is gonna take on the challenge and grow and develop and, and really function as they move through life. So what are the guiding principles? Most modern parents are reactive. By that I mean they wait for something to happen and then they say something. And usually what they say is all the things you're not supposed to say in PCIT. They give a command, they criticize, or they ask a question like, how come you don't have your homework done? Um, so that's what happens in reactive parenting. Proactive parenting is like the mama duck where you have a vision of what it's gonna to be to get your young person safe and strong and into the future. And through that visualization, you help create that kind of a young person. Any of you done pottery on the wheel? Thrown pots? Yeah. When you're, when you're doing the clay, are you looking at the book about how to do it? Or are you feeling the clay with your hands and looking at the pot as you put a little pressure here and a little pressure there? If you were to think about it, you would go into your head and you'd have a picture of what you're trying to create with your hands. That's visualization. How many of you ride horses? <laughs> yeah. Um, when I talk to, I don't ride horses, but when I talk to horse people, it's almost as if the horse can read your mind. And if you're a mindless horse rider, those are the kinds of horse, uh, people that the horse tries to throw off, right? But if you know how to ride a horse and you can visualize that, that horse will follow your lead because you're in control and you have a vision about what you want to accomplish. It's exactly the same type of thing with proactive parenting. So in that context, we really want to help kids ad address challenges, we certainly want to provide support, but more importantly, we want to think about skill building as a kind of core component. I'm not saying we shouldn't love our children, but loving our children without really helping them develop the skills and capacities to transfer, trans, uh, move smoothly through all the uh, adult stages or child and adult stages is really not going to help them very much. The other part is helping kids take, giving kids the opportunity to take responsibility. And lastly, there is no kid who will grow and develop unless there's somebody there to pat them on the back, give them the okay sign, give them a wink, a thumbs up, a high five. That kind of reward in the context of doing something in a competent way is really what builds children over time. So in this light, which of these balances between challenge and support, the lower side is the more side, the higher side is the light side, these are teeter-totters. What would you think is the best teeter-totter for helping a kid to grow safe and strong? Not that one. It's this one. If I was to say to you, how much can you lift now? 100 pounds, 50 pounds? 
So what we're going to do is if you want to lift 75 pounds, we're going to give you 50 pounds today. Next week, we're going to give you 40 pounds. Then we're going to give you 30 pounds. Then we're going to give you 20 pounds. Will you ever get to 75 pounds? No. We're going to start at 55, then we're going to 52 and a half, then 55, and then 57 and a half, and then 60 and 62. That's how you get your way there. We provide support. We don't overwhelm you with challenge, right? We give you just enough challenge that you can sharpen your skills and you can take on those difficult things in life. Sad to say, this is what I think is happening in most of America where we have gotten away from thinking about how important challenge is and what we really want to do is we want to make life easier for our children and as a result, as a result, we oftentimes make it difficult for them to be resilient and strong. So again, as I mentioned, these are the skills, right? Early developmental tasks, really that's the feeding, sleeping, and toileting. Behavior control, which is excitement and anger. Academic tasks, independent and group learning. And then really in later adolescence, those social tasks. How do we do it? Well, the way we teach it in Family Spirit is we teach a daily routine. Because embedded within a daily routine that's developmentally appropriate are all of the opportunities, even for the infant, to begin to develop competencies. I'm going to tell you a quick story about an 18-year-old or 18-month-old neighbor of mine whose mother stayed home with him until he was 18 months, then took him to daycare. Took him to daycare, it was the first week, she felt horribly guilty. Took him to daycare, picked him up, brought him home. First thing she would do was change his diaper and then kind of give him a snack. And so day one, that was the routine. Day two, that was the routine. Day three, that was the routine. Day four, puts him on the changing table and she reaches down to change his diaper and pushes the hands away. She's like, oh my God, he's never done that before. What's happening at that daycare center? Must be somebody abusing him goes once more, pushes the hands away. She's getting very nervous now. Goes once more, pushes the hands away, then says, mommy, me do it. Grabs the Velcro straps in front, pushes the front of the diaper down, hands above his head. <laughs> they had trained him in four days at the daycare center to fully participate in his diaper change. <laughs> he became very competent, and when his mother in a loving way, took away that from him or de-skilled him at 18 months. He was sensitive to that. Does that make sense? All of those things that we think about doing with very young children that are done out of love, that don't necessarily put that young person in the position to teach us about the dry cry or the wet cry, the hungry cry, the tired cry, and really facilitating that kind of competence, even within infancy, we are missing the opportunity to put the bedrock of resiliency in. In older kids, especially when they're learning behavior and emotion control tasks, we really want them to be able to acknowledge mistakes. We want them to apologize, make amends. But really, really important is if they do something wrong, they have to change. And what happens often in modern parenting, what we do is we accept the apology and we don't get the behavior change. So I'm not a big guy about apologizing. I'm really looking for that fundamental shift, that looking that young person in the eye and seeing that behavior change. We gotta reward children. There are families, there are families that um, um, honestly believe that kids should just do it because it's the right thing to do. And how many of you would work for no pay? There we go. It's the right thing to do, you know, to, to work hard. Uh, um, okay, you got the point. Resilient children, when I see a resilient child, they are active, active, active. They are deeply engaged in age-appropriate activities. My favorites nowadays are sports and music in addition to academic stuff. They all have, also have deep commitments to relationships. In close communities, those relationships are very healthy and healing, but they also teach people about the diversity of human emotion and behavior. 
And I really want kids to develop a self-awareness, but it is an awareness of in action. It is who am I when I'm doing something and who am I when I'm with other people. And lastly, I really want to see kids think and plan. Again, planning is so important in creating a life for oneself. So what do we do? We start early with a daily routine. We sequence those tasks and rewards. We use the relationship with parents who are the model for peer relationships. The reason why some kids don't drink or use drugs is because their parents are there and the model for their relationship is really the parent-child relationship and they look for that kind of stability and predictability with their peers. If they find a dangerous or risky peer, those kids stay away because they know that those relationships are not good for them. Um, how to, I think we just have a couple left. Um, again, I've talked about self-understanding and thinking and planning. And um, structure and routine for me is really the, the kind of hallmark of how you teach kids. One of the things, I love PCIT, but PCIT is in the moment advice. And what we try to do is we try to create a lifestyle, a way of living in which all of the positive living experiences are embedded in a daily routine. And we think that that's probably the best way to teach and train. I have given many people a lot of advice, stay consistent, be firm, don't let your kid talk back, and the families all agree with me and then have a very difficult time implementing. When I do it through the daily routine, all of those behaviors are embedded in space and time around the appropriate developmental tasks, and parents really learn what it is at that moment to kind of uh, manage those behaviors. So with that, I think I'll quit. We're gonna go to the panel. Yeah? I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Hi, good afternoon. I um I really appreciated your this last presentation. Thank you about the structure and dysregulation that children need. I absolutely believe that. Uh, my question is, how do we um, get parents who are themselves very dysregulated and emotionally labile and, and struggling with their own things when we have sometimes, well, I'm CPS, so I have short periods of time to work with families, of course, and um, I think a lot of times our parents do believe, you know, especially when they're coming to visit or only seeing their children periodically, structure is the last thing on their mind. Right, um, providing that sort of structure and sticking to routines and that sort of thing can be the last thing on their mind. But again, especially when they're so dysregulated themselves and have all that emotional stuff that they're dealing with. So um, I guess kind of my question is, how do we do that when, in the absence of the parent having that themselves? Yeah, I get that, I get that question a lot. Um, so, so my answer, it'll sound kind of glib, but what else are you going to do? So if I can improve a dysregulated parent's consistency over time by 20 to 25%, that will make an enormous difference in that young person's life. So if that parent is up before the child three out of five mornings instead of zero out of five mornings, getting them ready for school, that kid's gonna have a better day, at least three out of five. So. This is the kind of thing where I start incrementally with parents and I just build. What, what I don't do is I don't abandon parenting as the critical factor between all of the parent-related activities and all the child-related and child outcomes. That, that thing you saw with Family Spirit where it showed parenting right in the middle. Parenting for me is the enzymatic step, if you will, between parent factors and child factors. And you can't, you can't go around it. So I will work with parents wherever they are. And if they really have a lot of problems, it's about building it and teaching and working with them. 
But what tends to happen in most mental health clinics is those parents usually are dysregulated. They have a lot of uh, daily stresses and strains. They have a lot of uh, difficulties, and so they get a lot of supportive care, but they don't necessarily get the care that's going to help them stabilize their family life. So with those families, we provide some support, but really get to the focus on the parenting, even if they really are in a lot of trouble and they've got a long way to go. Any other questions? So I, had, I guess I had one question. Um, we saw in Melissa's presentation earlier, and we talked uh, in other presentations about the extended uh, kinship network, and in your intervention, you invite in three people, but of course, I think the um, parenting or caretaking network is, is expanded beyond that. So I wondered what thoughts you guys had on um, how, how the intervention might potentially reach out to other, if it might go through the system in some way, or, or what, because I, I assume you thought about that, the challenge of having to limit it, but the fact that there would be other additional caretakers involved. So I, I, my first reaction to that is, um, one of the things we struggle with a lot is the way we think this program should be implemented if you're just implementing it in the community and the way we have to implement it because of the fact that it's embedded within a research study to determine how effective it is. And there's some mismatch there, right? So the limit to three people coming is because of the resources we have, the, the funds we have for implementing this study, and also because of how much data we can track, those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, I think our hope is that these are things where we're teaching skills in parenting that will be shared across the community. And one of the things that we were really hoping to do by implementing this program in all of the different villages, communities around the reservation, is that if, if, this, if this is effective and we could continue doing this, then there's a community-wide change because the norm in the community becomes the adults involved in parenting youth in this age are all learning these skills and getting getting better guidance and support in what they should be doing with their children, right? And they're also, because they're participating in that program, we didn't talk a lot about the details of it, but they're participating in groups, in these family groups, that they're building connections and, and later, oops, sorry, lateral support networks among, with other parents in their community. And so, yeah, I think it sort of trickles down to, hopefully trickles, trickles out to other parenting figures. Is that sort of? Quick question. Um, in each of your programs, there's some approach to teaching parenting. And um, I wondered if you all could just reflect on the different um, cultures of parenting that have been brought to bear on the work that you do. So let, let me say one thing actually I just reacted to sort of is the teaching parenting. And I think that's one thing that we had a lot of discussions with our community advisors about was that we it wasn't going to work to come in with a program that says, this is what you should do, X, Y, and Z, right? And one of the reasons they really like the Strengthening Families program that, we, that was the foundation of the Tiwahi Gluasha copy was because it's more of an intuitive. It's, it's there are examples, there are discussions, but the idea is Parents know a lot of this, and they need it sort of brought up, right? It needs to be sort of self-discovery of what's the right thing to do, because people do know a lot about what's the right thing to do, and there's a lot of cultural knowledge about how you should parent, and it's more providing the opportunity to discuss that and have that sort of discovery of knowledge rather than us coming in and saying, here's what you should do, X, Y, and Z. So I think that's, that's an important part of it, is that it, in order for people to really um, for it to really be meaningful in their lives, it has to be a little bit of that sort of deductive, you know, you kind of help them through a process of discovering what they really do know they ought to be doing with their children, which is fundamentally love them and the rest of it, you know, I, I mean, I think that's a lot of it is it sort of, it sort of comes out of that, but I, that's my comment on the teaching parent. I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, I think we're always really careful to about the language we use to not imply that there's, especially with a more universal approach, that there's an inherent 
lack of parenting skills, but really thinking of parenting as a practice. And, um, you know, just like if we, anything we practice, there's always room for gaining more skills, for deepening our knowledge, um, and, you know, building our approach over time. So I think that that's, you know, we try to be very mindful of that overall. Yeah, and I, and I, I didn't know what you meant until we started talking. Um, I think we're more skills-based, Crystal. Um, we, I think, help me out here, but I think, I think we teach skills. I think we work with young moms who don't have a lot of skills, and we start off with teaching them about pregnancy, labor, and delivery, a very frightening kind of thing for them and about what to expect, what they're gonna see, what those doctor visits are gonna be all about. There's a ton of content. So I think if we were to, um, if we were to think about kind of what you guys just described, we would, we would probably say there's kind of a minimal amount of content that you need as a parent to know about yourself and about children. And um, if you're working with really young moms who, who have been in disrupted families and don't have a lot of experience of even been, having been cared for themselves, some basic content around being pregnant, labor, delivery, early child care, diapering, breastfeeding, we, we really think that there's a content that needs to be transmitted in the context of a, of a caring and supportive relationship. Did I say that right? <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, uh, Michelle, you mentioned uh, treaty obligations and Alicia you mentioned policy implications and tribal leaders thinking about these things and I just wondered if any of you have comments about policies or um, tribal leaders and what you know what you would suggest to them or if you had two minutes in an elevator with them what you would say or you know if this work has given you thoughts on that anybody um, I don't know if this is addressed addresses your question directly, but as a researcher, in fact, W.J. Uh, made this happen. Hi, W.J. <laughs> um, he made it possible, I know this is not a routine thing, but it was a unique opportunity for myself and some other, uh, some colleagues who are working on a national study of tribal Head Start programs to be able to meet with tribal leaders as part of the Secretary's Tribal Advisory Committee. And so I think opportunities, someone mentioned NCAI, of how, uh, and our work that I didn't get a chance to talk about today um, through, for example, the Tribal Early Childhood Research Center, we're really called to and charged with working very closely with tribal community members who in turn task us with working with tribal leaders. And so how we can make our data accessible and known and digestible and meaningful mm -hmm to tribal leaders who may be in those positions of meeting with, for example, on the stack heads of various agencies or um, lobbying on behalf of their communities. I think connecting our data to what um, tribal leaders are doing is really important. Um, so I'm on our tribal research review board. So we see all the research that comes to our reservation and we review it, And but that isn't enough for our capacity um, and research because we can't do everything. So, you know, if they need technical support or if they need to be hooked up with a tribal program, um, that's on them to do. So getting our tribe involved in that, in, in that process, I mean, our tribe did pass the ordinance for our research review board so that we could do that, so they didn't have to do all that. Um, so, but we have a two-year administration for our tribe, so we get new people in every two years and we have to re-educate and talk to them again and tell them <laughs> who the research review board is, um, what we do, you know. Um, so keeping that constant communication and transparency and, and, you know, the systems we work in, we work in a variety of systems. We work in our tribal systems, we work in academia, we work in uh, community systems, which is diversity within our communities, um, funding, things like that. So, so learning how to work within those systems um, and, and I always really try to push the tribal research capacity because if we have that on the ground, um, we, can, we can be that link between all those different systems because we know the systems, we know how to work within them. Um, and so policy-wise, you know, just getting more data-driven policy in our communities, um, health data, you know, and we've had a big 
push for smoking cessation in different tribal buildings, um, casinos, um, and that's huge for, for our health. So just getting that kind of policy and information out there um, to, try, to tribal governments. Um, but like I said, the, our, our systems are, you know, we have a two-year tribal government, you know, <laughs> term. So we have a lot of turnover. So it's just continuing to have advocates in our community that, you know, re-educate those new um, tribal council members and continue to go to the committees and, and talk and, and network and keep people involved and keep all the systems on the same page, so. Thanks. All right, please join me in, in uh, thanking our panel. <laughs>